Hello and welcome to Sales Academy Showcase with your host Adam Brooks. So Sales Academy Showcase is a show where we interview leaders in business to get underneath uh, and to go a little bit deeper to, to learn a bit more about the people behind the brands that they've built. So I'm a big fan of podcasts but what I would say is podcast safely. Listening to engaging content can distract you from your daily life. So no animals or business leaders were harmed in the making of these shows yet. So today we have the pleasure of a conversation with Becca Lightfoot, uh, an individual who, who I believe has uh, an awesome business and an inspiring and inquisitive mind. So an inspiring message as well. So someone I, I'd like to hang out with and I always gauge people by, would I like to have a beer with them? And this is a lady that I certainly do. So I'll let them introduce themselves in more detail. I'll let Becca introduce herself better uh, than I can uh, as we get into the conversation. But I thought what would be a great place to start uh, Becca, if that's okay with you, is can you just tell the listeners how did we first meet? Crikey, okay. Um, well, I met your business partner about three years ago, probably. It must be coming up for three years because it was the summertime. Mm -hmm. We were at a networking event, and I think one thing that we both had in common was that we didn't particularly enjoy networking events so we've been hunting around for the right kind of networking event with the right kind of tribe and I think having not had a business background I certainly didn't find networking I love people hmm. but um I I think I just hadn't found my networking tribe yet okay so um you know to be fair coming across sales academy was like a breath of fresh air because they you know, in your face straight away you acknowledge lots of the I can't really dress it up. Lots of the wanky things about business. Um, <laughs> and I just thought, I love that. I, that. That's like the voice from inside my head is now outside my head. So this is great. I think I've found my tribe. So I connected with your business partner first. Um, we had a couple of conversations over the phone and she invited me along to a foundation day, which you guys are running at, at Sales Academy. And I just liked the thought of someone getting under the bonnet of, of my business. You know, my business had been built using a network marketing model up to that point. Yeah. So having had no business background, that was comforting for me that I was just plugging into a system. But I knew that my business needed to be different. So to go along to something where I could really dig down and look at what, what a business actually meant, what, what it meant to run a business, I got, I got the first idea, to be fair. Um, so I came along to the, the foundation day that you guys ran at Sales Academy and um, yeah, you were there running that day and that was quite a, quite a moment. It was indeed. <laughs> it was indeed. Um, yeah. yeah, it was interesting. There was only, we, only, we only have a few people in that event, so we limit the numbers because it's, it's quite a personal event as well. There's a lot of honesty that comes out in that room very, very quickly. So too many people, the ego takes over, the bullshit starts and stuff. So we intentionally keep that room small so it can be that intimate but that 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 real honesty yeah there were only four or five of us there that day i think so straight away that sort of put me at ease because i didn't feel like i was being um i didn't feel like anyone in the room was in any position to necessarily know better have all the answers it was you know that's something you did very well at sales academy in that particular workshop and, and all the others is, is kind of create that safe environment where yeah. You're never going to get anywhere with your business if you're not honest. Thank you. So, yeah. you. so creating that environment for like, right, let's get, let's drill down. Let's get honest. Have you got a freaking clue what you're doing? No. Nope. Um, <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, was, was great. So, so yeah, I, I did that foundation day and then a couple of phone calls later again, sort of was offered the opportunity to work with you guys. And I loved that as well, that it's not a given meet us, work with us, job done. Mm. It's a kind of, is this a fit? Are we even, you know, are we going to work, walk, walk in the same path? So, yeah. you know, and I like that, respect mm. that a lot. Yeah, and you, you obviously didn't know then, you get this now, this isn't a sales advertisement for, for Sales Academy, but, you know, we talk about this a lot in terms of we're precious about this family, this community. We don't just want to bring anyone in, so we don't want to work with everybody. Yeah. But at the same time, we accept and respect that not everybody's going to want to work with us, you know? that. So that authenticity came we, we drive that in terms of, yeah, I do swear like a fish wife. I act a bit of a knob at times. I'm not afraid to because, <laughs> yeah, I try. Because uh, I want to encourage people that we don't know what we don't know. So just be the best we are. 
and be unapologetically the best we are and keep improving that compete with ourselves just get better at that getting more real getting more honest getting more authentic and you'll attract and repel the right kind of people in your lives in your business and everything else so um i'm glad you felt that then and i truly hope you know that now <laughs> yeah, yeah so you know and, and being a family member and sort of growing into that family and then and then being part of that sales academy family has been has been huge you know that at that point with my business you know, in a network marketing business, you absolutely are relying on who's gone before you. Now, the beauty of that model is you don't have to walk your own path. You, walk, you follow it, you know, follow my leader type yeah. thing. But when your leader's done one, and so was their leader, and then you're trying to connect with someone who either doesn't know you or they weren't what attracted you into the business. You know, I got to a point really where I... I'd lost my tribe. And for me, a basic human need of mine is that sense of love and connection and belonging. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel like I belonged to who, who now my parents and business were. Yeah. I didn't feel like anybody gave a shit whether I did it or not. And the problem was I had found myself in a point where I, I absolutely needed to give a shit. Yeah. But that still, you know, I, I even had it thrown back at me, you know, well, you shouldn't need anyone to give a shit about your business. You should give enough of a shit. And that should be your motivating driver. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, that doesn't work for me as a lover and a connector, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> no. um, so I knew what I was looking for, but I actually didn't know that, that people like you guys were out there. And I think that's one thing that I've realized over the last three years in business. So many people feel the isolation of working for themselves. It's a beautiful thing working for yourself, but it can also be really lonely. So I was feeling that sense of being lost and I knew that my business needed to be different, but I didn't know how and I didn't know where. And it, you know, it absolutely was a chance meeting with Amanda and, and, you know, and I will always be grateful to her for that. Um, but really? Foundation Day and connecting with you there was literally a complete turning point. Yeah, and we've, we'll talk about, thank you, mate. We'll talk about some of that journey a little bit more. And also delve a little bit into, if, you, if it's okay with you, because I'll ask you some questions as we go through this and kind of drill down on that. Um, because I want to get underneath who you are as well as the business and stuff. But, you know, ask, uh, asking some questions about that multi-level model and what that looks like, because some people listening won't know what that means, right? So we'll explore into all of that, but also how your business has evolved into what it is now. And th that's also still evolving, right? So before we get into any of that, though, I'll, I'll t take us back a little bit, right? I want to go back even further. So before you were doing this, Becca, um, I want to find out, and, and I want you to tell the listeners a little bit about what were you doing before? So give our listeners, our viewers, a bit of a background about who is, who is Becca? Tell us about you. In the olden days. So, um, so I am a scientist, I guess, by training. I, I left school uh, at school. I wanted to be a medic. It took me a long time to convince myself I was clever enough to be a doctor. Um, and I put myself through the food and meal with medical school interviews. That was a fascinating experience. Um, and I, I got conditional offers at medical school, three different medical schools across the country, which is ace. You know, I'm following in the footsteps of a brother who's a vet. Um, you know, very clever boy. And my younger brother is a, is a, is a clever one as well. So I've always had that... You know, I am academic, I accept I'm academic, but I always had to work for hard for that. Um, and my teachers acknowledge that as well. So, um, she's quite clever. <laughs> she's not quite those two. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, I had, I pushed myself hard at school um, and then I didn't get my A-level physics grade. Because physics is like madness, we all know that. Um, so I was devastated, absolutely devastated. And I remember having a, a letter from my dad that summer that I got my results and my world had literally, the arse had fallen out of my world, I didn't know what to do. And I remember my dad writing to me, which is a rare thing, dad's writing letters, right? Yeah. Um, but he wrote to me and he told me the story. You know, my dad's a dentist, he's been a dentist all, all my life. I, I didn't know that he'd ever wanted to do anything else, but he wrote me this beautiful letter about wanting to be a vet and realizing that he could have done it, but he wouldn't have had a life. Yeah. He would have had to work so hard. And he said, you know, don't underestimate what an experience going to university can be. 
and, and don't write off your chance to go, go, do something you enjoy, you're interested in, you can excel at, but that you can still enjoy life as well. And that was a massively profound moment for me. And I think a huge, a huge weight off my shoulders in terms of I wasn't a failure. I wasn't a failed medic. And I know I get told off for saying it every now and then as a bit of a, a merry quip type thing. But so I went off to do to do bi to study biological sciences. And then one of the things that I loved about being at Scottish University was you went and studied a massive breadth of, of science to start with. Yeah. And then in the following year, you could explore the areas you were particularly interested in. And, you, and I didn't have to drill down and decide what my specialism was until I'd been at university for three years. Okay. So that was when I decided that I was going to study kind of infectious diseases as my, you know, little bit of excitement. I'd done that as um, work experience at school and I loved it. Um, and the human body, biology has always fascinated me. The human body is ace. Don't even get me started with that, right? But... <laughs> But the things that happen to the human body, because things that have been on this planet for millions of years before us, and they're gonna be millions of years after us, I just found that fascinating. Um, and the way that these tiny little microscopic things can switch things on and switch things off and be fine, and then have devastating consequences. And I was like, man, that is so cool. Um, and you know, I just I had some great some great people at university around me. I had some great professors who were inspiring and they encouraged me to go off and do a work placement. Yeah. So my fourth year at university, I've milked to university for years now. <laughs> my fourth year at university was spent working at Port and Down. Um, uh, MOD facility. It, yeah, it's a de department for... I can't even remember what DERA stood for at the time, but it changed its... It changed its name so many times, trying to not be what it blatantly obviously was. Yeah. Um, but I had the most fantastic year there, working in what we called wet science. So active research, or at the bench, doing the science kind of research. And I loved it, and I, and I met some brilliant people and was involved in some really cool stuff that I'm very, very proud to have been involved in. Um, one of the things that I was involved in was developing a a kit basically that they were going to use on active service out in theatre and to be involved in that like working your Saturdays making up kits packing up kits and then training lads that are in the RAF to go out and, and use those kits and knowing that you know in a couple of months time they're going to be in theatre using stuff that you've helped to create and ultimately that has the potential to save not only their lives but our troops lives and hundreds of civilians of lives as well wow. Why? Yeah. Don't think about it at the time, but when you step away from it, you're like, shit, that's pretty cool. I'm, I'm really proud of that. So I loved it there. I loved the wet science. That kind of then fostered an enthusiasm for, for research. So after my degree, I went off and did a PhD and just spent a few more years at university. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of, you know, I thought that science was my path and then uh, got distracted by a boy. Um, and academia was, was PhD was tough, academia was tough, and I think it's quite often you don't realise when you're in something, you don't realise what it's really like until you're in the thick of it. Yeah. And um, academia is tough. You know, you've got, to, you've got to pull in the research grants, you've got to publish papers, you've, you've got to build a reputation for yourself, and, and there are people that are willing to, to criticise and knock your science, knock your mm. expertise at uh, you know uh, or or you go into teaching and then actually quite often to have a teaching job at a university you need to be actively encouraging research money into the department as well so it's, it's a lot of balance there's a lot of demands on you yeah and neither of us you know i love my bugs and he loved his worms but we didn't love it that much um so so chris left he was two years ahead of me with his phd so he left and he joined the ministry of defense Went down to Port and Bizarrely and worked with my mates, Ruth. Um, oh, and, uh, yeah, so he moved down to Bristol and then I finished my PhD up in Nottingham and then I moved down to Bristol to be, to be with him too. And I went into teaching. I went back to my first love as a seven-year-old in Mr. Roberts' class. Yeah. Um, at primary school. And I became a teacher. And I loved, 
you know, the expectation to be a, a secondary science teacher is huge when you've got an academic background like that. But, um, but to be able to charge around the field like a Roman soldier or play the most beautiful music and encourage your children to really dig deep into their heart and their imagination to, to, to build an entire world on which to, to base their creative writing is ace. You know, to, to get to do that, like those light bulb moments, you know. That's quite a shift even, though from science to teaching in, in some senses. Like you said, if you're going to go and teach science at university, yeah, that makes sense so far through your PhD. But to, to go from the science to the teaching is quite a pivot, right? Yeah, but I suppose, it, yeah, it, it, it is, yeah, on the outside. I think it's the things that you learn when you're doing a PhD, the sort of self-discipline, the resilience, the resourcefulness organization yeah. you know that kind of stuff um yeah. that helps i think the maturity being five years older than or, or even more than that than some of my peers that were that were training alongside me doing their pgc's yeah that that was interesting you know just a different view of so life you mentioned a couple of times that academia was hard for you then. so is there anything bubbling away right you wanted to change that and make it better was that was that anything in terms of driving you to get into teaching did you want to help kids that you? I I loved the idea of I mean I don't know whether you, I don't know whether you can remember back at primary school that much longer than when I was there. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I remember going into school with a leaf that I'd found on the way to school, and then it seemed like the entire day was built around the leaf. We did poetry, we did art, we were a leaf in PE, and we were like gl gliding around the the school hall in our vest and pants because we've got our PE kit and all those kind of great things we had to do at school. Yeah, yeah. And I love the thought of that freedom in the curriculum. And I think various schools have tried that. But when I was teaching, we were heavily ensconced in the national curriculum. We had the national literacy strategy. We had the national numeracy strategy. I mean, God, you could buy a clock that beat every 10 minutes in a lesson to make sure that you were moving from your introduction to your at desk learning and then 20 minutes before the end you got them back on the carpet for the plenary to review it you're like oh my god it was that prescriptive wow i remember a moment where i was in my professional review and my head teacher was asking me to critique the value added scores of the children in my class based on whether they were red orange or green headlights traffic light mm. and i just thought this is bollocks yeah, love that. I am in the wrong place because I've got a year three. Not what I signed up for, right? Is that kind of, it's not what I signed up for. Absolutely, absolutely. I, you know, I got a year three class that year and that's a tough gig teaching year three. You're teaching a first year of juniors. So they are coming physically upstairs in that school. Yeah. Mummy's not bringing them upstairs anymore. So, She's trying, but so I'm the one that's then got to say to her, you can wait downstairs, they can come upstairs. They know where to put their coat, they know where to put their bag. You know, I'm the one that's standing at the door saying, it's not your fault that they haven't got their spelling book. It's Friday and they know Friday is spelling test day. It's their responsibility to have their spelling book. It's yeah. their responsibility to have, you know, and there's times you feel like an absolute bitch when you're a year three teacher. Yeah. But one of the things that was my responsibility was to help them to become more independent. Yeah, totally. Some of the children are fine with that. Some of them aren't. Some oh, of the parents, parents are fine with that. Some of the parents aren't, you know, so... But I've got kids in my class, you know, I was being questioned as to why they were an orange or a red traffic light. And I'm like, that child couldn't read when they came to me in September. That, chi that child's family have fallen apart this year. Yeah. That, you know, that child's been through this. There was no room for my children to be children. Okay. Well, that's how it felt at times. For individuals, right? Yeah. So... I remember, I remember Chris feeling similarly about the MOD at times. Mm. And I, you know, maybe it's, maybe it is the same when you are a public servant, whatever it is that you're doing. That feeling at times, and I, you know, the NHS have just been through a, a great and a challenging period of time. Mm. But sometimes you're in that system and you feel that system is inherently broken. Mm. And you, you do it because it's vocational, you want to make a difference. You know, I went into teaching because I wanted to touch people's lives. Yeah. I went, I wanted to be a medic. And I remember my, at my medical school interview being asked that question, why do you want to be a doctor? And I said, because 
I want to make a difference. I want to help people. I want to make a difference. He went, be a bin man. And I remember feeling like I'd been slapped in the face. You know, because to, to me, that was you saying that contribution, which is one of my other basic human needs. Yeah. You know, what is the point in growing if you don't do something with it? But that was someone saying to me at that point at 19 years old, one of your basic human needs basically bollocks. Why? Wow. And that stuck with me for a long time. So even going into a teaching interview and saying, why do you want to be a teacher? I would, I need to say something profound here that's not, I want to, now bollocks to it. I want to touch people's lives. It's a, it's a massive privilege to touch people's lives, to make a difference. Yeah. I bet if we went back, that guy would say, well, I said it to motivate you, but there are other ways. Thanks. There yeah. are. There really are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there really are. And how very dare he shatter one of your values in his eye of the world, right? In his perspective. That's yeah. right. But yeah. ultimately I, you know, when I left teaching, I left teaching to become a parent. Mm. And one of the things that I remember, you know, I remember having a conversation with quite a few people and then sort of saying to me, as you approach the end of your piece, so what's next? What's next? You know, you've got your PhD now, what's next? Yeah. And I remember saying, I, I want to be a wife. I want to be a mum. And then being like, Oh, like you've yeah. worked this hard and now you're like, what? Yeah, and so it's almost like that. Oh, but you're throwing it all away. It's like, yes. you're going to be a mum, to go and be a parent, to go and be one of the best things. We yeah, yeah. And at that point, Chris, Chris was private secretary to the guy that was running Abbey Woods, the Defence Procurement Agency. So he was working stupid hours, massively stressful job. Yeah. And we got one child by then. And, you know, if you're going to be a, a parent, I believe you need to be a present parent. And so both of us working would not have worked for us as a family. So I decided to put my career on hold and to be mum at home because that's what I wanted to do. And that's what I believed was the right thing for our family. So I genuinely wasn't looking for mm. anything else. And it was the week that I made that decision to leave teaching that I walked into the opportunity to become involved in network marketing. And that was literally walking into it at the Mall at Cribs Causeway. All right. So you kind of bumped into your future life. Yeah, yeah. My, my sponsor, Sarah, was walking along. Um, I was walking along the top layer of, of the mall at Cripps Causeway. I was pushing a push chair and William was by the side of the push chair. So Georgie was in the push chair. William was by the side of it. And I think I remember screeching at William something about hurry up, like grab that bottle or cup or something that was rolling towards the door of Clinton's car. Lost my mummy cool for a moment. And I remember Sarah coming up to me and saying, excuse the unusual approach, but um, I'm looking for some great people to work with me in my work from home business. I'm looking for parents in particular. Um, and, you know, you just look like the perfect person to come and chat to. And I'm thinking, what part of me screeching at my two-year-old to fetch that muscle as it goes towards the door makes me seem like a good prospect for your business? This is hilarious. I, I've got to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't always see what we... Uh... Well, we see in others what they don't see in themselves, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Okay, fab. So there's a, there's a good kind of backstory and a background into um, you, which is important in these interviews, right? I want to find out more about you. And that, that's the personality is coming through, which, which I love. So thank you for that. So I, I may dance about with a couple of these questions, but yep. what, you're, what you're doing now, I want to fast forward to what you're doing now. Mm -hmm from that moment with Sarah and everything else. And I want you to kind of look back at it and go, what inspired you, Bex, to get into this? To what I'm doing now? Yeah, what inspired you to do it? Who? Who? Yeah. I thought yeah. we'd just leave that for a moment. Yeah, no, 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 it's pick, it's pick. So you realize I have two boys, right? So mum of boys, there's an awful lot of life is about who. Um, or like the workings of the human body. And um, so at, at the point where my business pivoted from, so, so that the business that I built with Sarah, my network marketing business, had grown to the point where I had replaced my teaching salary. I had no reason to go back to teaching after I'd sort of finished my maternity leave with George. Well done, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, but then it just kind of stagnated. And I, was, I felt like I was fighting um, my role at home and, and growing my business. Okay. And there were times when it caused problems at home. Um, 
And then our family circumstances changed massively. Uh, my husband, Chris, was killed in a motorbike accident three and a half years ago. Mm-hmm. And suddenly my work from home business that, yes, it had replaced my teaching salary, that needed to become a breadwinner's business. But it needed to become a breadwinner's business around the fact that at that point, my boys were six and nine. Why? And that was the point, it was about six months after that, that I met you guys and, and started working with you guys. And, and initially I was like, I don't have the capacity to do anything else. I've got to try and make this work, but I can't because make it, you know, taking my business to the next level under this model, I felt was going to take me away from two boys who were broken mm-hmm. and who needed me to be around. And I needed to stabilize as much as I could. So... I was kind of thinking, how can I make this more? How can I do this differently? And we'd started to work on some stuff in terms of my values and who I was and why I shied away from my background as a scientist Mm. and didn't sort of, you know, bring that to the forefront of my business. And something in me was resisting that and I didn't really know what it was. And we were sitting at the dinner table one night, as you do when you have boys, eating your tea, talking about poo, because that's what they do. They'd both been learning about the human body at school that day. And one of the things I love about the way that they learn at their school is that the topics track. So when George is doing something in year two, William was doing it in year four, but he was doing like the next layer of it. But it means that they could talk over dinner and have that shared understanding. Great way, yeah. Absolutely. And they started talking about the human human body and digestion and poo, obviously. Um, And I remember George, age six years old, sort of interjecting at one point in this conversation, going, do you know something, mommy? You actually know quite a lot. (laughs) And he would have said it exactly that way. He absolutely did. You know, George, he absolutely did say it just (laughs) like that. And I remember thinking to myself, thanks. Um, But (laughs) I actually remember thinking, my God, I love this. You know, we'd literally talked about the journey of food from your mouth until you have a poo. And just talking about the way that, you know, this happens in this part of your body and then it goes into there and then this is added and that and does that, just that. And they were fascinated by it. And I just remember thinking that is because the human body is really cool. And that's why, you know, I loved that my business was in natural health and well-being. So understanding how the products that I was working with in my network marketing business worked with my body, worked with my immune system and all that kind of stuff. I kind of loved that my science gave me the grounding in that. Yeah. But engaging with them in a conversation at tea time over poo and thinking, this is what you love. You know, I was sitting back in Mrs. Smith's A-level biology class, doing the alimentary canal, doing the digestive system, thinking, oh my God, I love this shit. You know, this bit, oh my God, the human body is so cool. And that's the next time I saw you guys about a week later, I was sort of saying, right, I've got gaps. I've got gaps in my knowledge. I've got gaps in my professional development. And I remember you saying, how can you have gaps in your knowledge when you have a PhD are you kidding me you know do you need this or do you just need to get on with it you know why are you so caught you challenge you really challenged me in terms of why have you got to have a certificate to be able to do something to offer that advice to help people Mm. Uh, but then respectfully just kind of went okay and sort of let me let me do it the way that I felt I needed to to do it have that vocational recognition for it so that's when I started exploring my sort of vocational qualifications in terms of being a nutrition practitioner. Yeah. And that then built that, for me, that then built, it almost filled in a jigsaw piece of, of what I was offering. So yes, I still, even now I still work with the products that I've always worked with as part of Forever. And I still believe in those products, absolutely. But to be able to have a nutrition practitioner's qualification to back up the advice that I'm giving, to back up the recommendations that I'm giving. And, and don't get me wrong, I, I will recommend not products as often as I recommend products. Yeah. Products are fantastic to support, but you know, the, the lifestyle changes that you need to make, the nutritional changes that you need to make, you know, the fuel that you're putting in your machine, that's the primary, primary thing that's important. So that's where it kind of came from. And then ever since we were working together and looking at the structure of the business, it has been like, right, these are the foundations and now what are these little bits that I need to build into my wall? So I don't feel my wall is a bit crumbly and higgledy-piggledy. I feel like my wall is a solid foundation for a strong business that is a sustainable business. It's a business that can grow and it's a business that can evolve with me as I evolve and my interests evolve and my experiences and my knowledge evolves. 
but it's also a sound business that will bring me a regular income because I am the breadwinner for yeah. the family. Yeah, and it's, it, you know, I, I say this a lot, and you know, you know this, but I, it, it's a privilege to, to, to go on anyone's journey with them. Uh, and I'm extremely proud of seeing the, the, the shifts in you over the three years that is that we've kind of worked together and known each other in that in that space. Because I was challenging your thinking a lot back in in the day because I didn't really understand where you were coming from. I didn't really know what was driving it. Is, are you looking at qualifications as an excuse for not to do this so you can just go and be one of those teachers in the future? Or are you actually looking at this as because you want the validation and the recognition and the or do you, do you actually need to formulate what you already know into more structured detail? I just needed to challenge your thinking about it because I wanted to, I wanted you to be clear on the decisions you were making and to see and feel and hear the shifts, not just in you as a, as a human, as somebody who is, you know, as, as somebody with a PhD, that's no, you know, small achievement to then be able to go, I'm excited about learning again. I want to grasp this now and I want to grasp this now. You never ever stop with your desire to, to learn more and develop more and grow more, but purposefully. Yeah. And that is the thing that I see the biggest difference with you and I see with a lot of people that always want to go down this learning is a lot of the time they're going down the learning route to avoid the doing route. Yeah. But you, you, you marry those two beautifully together in terms of it's purposeful reason, purposeful learning, purposeful doing. Yeah, it's not if it's about, it's that's just about my confidence, I think. And, you know, I, I, you probably have more confidence in me than maybe I have in myself. Uh, that's just those moments that I have. And that's the great thing about having a coach. You know, it is a whole nap champion on your shoulder going, come on, come on, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So and, for me, it's about, fun, yeah, it's, it's about my, it's just about my confidence to do, you know, the knowledge is there. And when I'm learning a lot of the time, it's revision. Yeah. But it's kind of solidifying that understanding. It's continual really professional there. development, isn't it? It's you know, the, the the day we stop learning is the day we kind of need to put another nail in, right? Yeah. So, okay. Um, and you talked about some of the challenging times that you've you guys have faced as a family, and just to just to tap into that for a second before we move on in terms of the, um, why you believe it so much, because you're already explaining that as well. But you did all this while being kind of mum and dad and raising two spirited young inquisitive boys as well that you know they are into everything in terms of they're clever boys as well so and you know clever boys take a lot of effort and a lot of mind space mm -hmm. <laughs> right. so it's um yeah it really has been a, a, a great journey that you've been on in the last three years i I'm, I'm dead excited to see where you go over the next three to five years with it because it's already there's been some massive changes in the last year so yeah. there's we're actually going to go back and revisit, I believe, one of the exercises we did back in a few years ago that really started to change things. We're going to do that again soon. So. Yeah, yeah. The, the most pivotal thing that I've ever done for my business and one that I'm now proud to take and, and use with, with my clients. Um, cool. And to see then the shifts that, that happen in them is huge. And, you know, that, that's a massive gift. Your generosity with your, with your resources and... and you know, that, that's, that's been huge for me on my journey and, and building my own toolkit. So thank you. It's abundance, right? We do this for the right reasons and we have enough people. We change the world one person at a time. So it's, there's a lot of similar values in, in stuff there. So um, you have answered this in lots of ways already, but I'm going to ask it specifically. So okay. why do you believe in what you do so much? Why is it so important to you that you would dedicate the time and the passion and the energy into it that you do? There's kind of two ways to answer that, this question, I guess. The fun? first way, the kind of sciencey way, I guess, is because the human body's ace. <laughs> it's <laughs> so cool. Yeah. It's, 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 and, geek, it's, and being geek is cool again, right? So it's all right. Not thanks for that. Um, <laughs> no, no, that's it. but that, that passion that but it's science right science is geeky yeah. to a lot of people and it isn't it's cool yeah it's, it's, it's it, cool it, so to to really kind of understand the way that the body works 
Yeah, to really understand the way that the body works is so exciting because when it doesn't work, trying to kind of, you know, it's, it's like being an, a, a private investigator. It, you know, you're putting together all the pieces, but then I'm probably equally fascinated, but maybe not yet so educated. I'm equally fascinated in human behavior and in the human mind. Yeah. And, you know, the way that our brain works, where that influences our behavior, the, the, the effect that that then has on our physical body, mm. how all of that links up with our neurochemical messengers, our hormones, our endocrine system, how complicated and brilliant that is. Yeah. You know, and then, and then as I say, you've got these infectious little critters that kind of, you know, come around and mess it all up and, you know, and how's, how's our immune system gonna, gonna deal with all that? So, you know, to me, being able to work with someone to understand their body is such a, a privilege and such an interesting and engaging and exciting thing to do, particularly when it's not making a lot of sense. Yeah. You know, you're like, no, nah, you know, right, okay, we need to pause this, we need to, we need to try this. So there's that element of what I do that I, I just think, you know, it's like, is it the fashion? In biology, brilliant. You know, <laughs> that. So yeah. there's that part of what I do. But then the other part of what I do, you know, when I'm not working nutritionally as such with clients, but when I'm working with them, I'm looking at their wider well-being, when I'm looking at the things in their life that are making things harder, uh, the things in their life that are challenging them that need a little bit of reshaping, that's not something I ever thought I was going to end up going into. But one of the reasons I guess I'm so passionate about that is there has to have been a reason for the last four years. Okay. There has to have been a point. Yeah. And I think, you know, when, when, you, when you think about the things that you've been through as you grow up, as you go from being a child to an adult, as you go from single to partnership as you go from partnership to parent uh, you, mm. you know, everything every opportunity that we have in life we are learning and you know yes the last four years at times have been unbelievably painful and shocking and i would give anything not to have had to phone my kids and tell them their dad was dead and you know, all of those things mm. There has to be a reason for it. And if I can help someone make one less mistake than me, if I can help someone feel one less iota of pain, if, you know, and that's not like a world to me thing, that's not a victim, but poor me. Um, I'd hope that that's a phrase that doesn't kind of get associated with me very often. But I was blessed with amazing grandparents. You know, they were wartime grandparents. They went through stuff we can only possibly imagine. Mm. But all of my grandparents were warm and they were loving people and they behaved with grace and dignity, even in really challenging times later in their lives. And I think that's one thing that they taught me. And, and I think I'm passionate about what I do and I believe in, in what I do because... it's it was my it's my reason it's my reason to keep going you know i yes i need to earn a living to be able to provide for my kids but i also need to be the example to my children that life doesn't owe us anything just because we got dealt a bit of a shitty sandwich one day yeah like your parents you know, I remember, I remember, for you. yeah you know I remember someone saying to me after chris died the cavalry ain't coming mm. i remember part of me thinking Shit, thanks for that and another time, that, that moment of clarity of just thinking, yeah. So. We're not really taught, we're not really taught how to deal with death, are we, in, in our culture? Yeah. Westernized culture, you know, Eastern cultures, death is very much embraced as part of life. It's taught at a very young age. It's all part of the woven culture of it. We kind of avoid it until it happens. And then we don't know whether we're grieving right. We don't know if we're doing it the right way. We'll give you the feedback that we are or we aren't doing it the right way, as we well know. But yeah yeah i think it's that you know one thing i've learned is to walk your own path with that try and do that with grace and dignity 
but to walk your own path with that. And I think that's true then for whatever you're going through in life. Yeah. You know, and, and that's where I'm blessed to support people who are going through some tough stuff in life. You know, yeah, I'll, I'll hold their energy. I'll, I'll stand behind them. I'll have my hand in their back. I'll have my hand held out if that's what they need. Mm. Um, but um, having the courage to walk your own path through that and believe that way, the way that you're doing it is good enough. It is right enough for you. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you feel like you're making it up as you're going along. Yeah. You know, get up, show up, do the day, and then put the day to bed and, and let it be. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had some amazing... You are an absolute walking example of that, from journaling late at night through to, you know, yoga, meditation, self-love, self-care, as well as, you know, being mind, very mindful of how you eat, what you eat, when you eat, exercise, that whole... Plan. And, what, and, you know, to do this and still have fun it's you get people that go right to the extreme and then you get people that are just like completely and utterly woven into the sofa and you're a very beautiful balance in between that which fits in lovely with the name of your business right tip the balance because it's kind of the needles always being we've had this conversation a lot right and everything in life the needles always being nudged we just got yeah. to become more aware of which way are we nudging or allowing the needle to be nudged and yeah. when we need to your zone. where are you happy for it to go you yeah. know how far this way how far that way yeah. What are your triggers for, for it not being acceptable anymore? And this, the, the hearing this, right, and I'm hoping our listeners are, are, are feeling the same because this is getting under the skin of the, the people behind the business. That's the purpose of these interviews, Bex. And one of the reasons that this makes you the, the, the brilliant coach and the brilliant human that, that you are and the nutritionist and everything that you are that you don't always see that you are is because this isn't about you. This isn't this ego thing. And I know a lot of coaches that are very ego driven. I know a lot of trainers that are very ego driven and they make it about them. You know, they're the difference and stuff. And it's not, it's about you uh, accepting and understanding that you're a small part and maybe a tiny catalyst in them, but you're that accountability and that sounding board and that, like you said, you hold their energy. You do that with utter grace all of the time. And it's challenging because I know this, we walk the same paths, right? It is challenging. There are times when you are biting your knuckle because the frustration of hearing the same excuses and the same noise, but we can't do it for them. We can't put the trainers on and run the, the marathon for them, right? Yeah. It's, it's I think how, that's one thing. How do we ask a different question? How do we poke? How do we redirect? How do we challenge them to think and act differently so they get different results rather than expecting different results but doing the same things, right? Yeah. And I think, I think working, certainly working with some of my nutrition clients in terms of, you know, are they, are they trying to achieve something in terms of their weight? Are they trying to achieve something in terms of the way that their body behaves in response to particular foods? Mm. You know, one of the things that I learned a long time ago was that you, yes, I want to be able to support people, but I need the ball back. It's their ball. It's not mine. And, and, you know, I'm sure it's the same for you. People, people thrusting their balls at you all the time. <laughs> people wanting you to take responsibility for yeah. it. Um, you know, I, I had a short period of time as a Slimming World consultant, and I remember one week one of my members coming in and literally losing her shit at the scales because she had put on half a pound that week. And mm. I said, to her, "Okay, well, don't worry about it. We'll talk about it in class, and you know, we'll we'll work it through." And she went, "I know exactly what it is." Okay. She says, you didn't send the support message on Saturday. You always send a support message on Saturday morning. And right enough, Saturday morning, when we were going to the supermarket, I would usually fire off the support message, you know, it's weekend, mm -hmm. blah, 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 you know. See what you can do to stay on track and all that kind of stuff. And she was deadly serious. She had put on weight between Saturday morning and Tuesday morning when she weighed in because I hadn't sent a support message on Saturday. Oh, how very day. Absolutely. And in the end, I said to her, I am very sorry that I've let you down this week. And I said, I was with my mum whose best friend died on Saturday morning. <laughs> well, let's just hope I have a better week next week then. Let's hope you do, because my mum's having a relatively shit time at the moment. But as long as you lose that. And, and I took that all massively personally. And I remember my mentor at the time saying to me, but you, you, you've got her ball. You've got all their balls. You need to give them all back. Yeah. Their weight loss results are not your responsibility. But... Yeah. You know, again, I was in that environment where I had lost weight with Slimming World. I wanted to give something back. And I think that's the thing when you are, I, you know, I resisted the term coach for a long time. Because yeah. um, I was worried that meant I had to have all the answers. I was worried that meant I'd got to have all the expertise. 
and all these you know misconceptions I had about being a coach and then I realized actually it's just about supporting people to to yeah. find what's inside them motivation their inspiration you know all of those things we just ask the questions we hold their energy we ask the questions and, and that realization that it my job is to drop the pebble and you know the ripples from that pebble could go anywhere yeah and i don't know where they've gone a lot of the time and you're certainly not expecting them sometimes to go bounce off and come back again and that's a beautiful thing when it does you know but we ask questions and sometimes those questions cause a little ripple and sometimes they cause a freaking great tidal wave yeah. um but it, they sure as hell people then <laughs> yeah. but that's it that's like you know the 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 the, the paradox if, it, if that's the right term in terms of how do i how do i give them back their balls but still care yeah and I, you know how do i care if i don't have their balls and all that sort of, and then you know, I, got, I haven't got that right with everyone yet. Ad. I know that I haven't got that right with everyone, but that's part of my journey and my development as a coach. And absolutely. I think this is mastery, mate. This is this is how yeah. it's continually. There's no better goldfish bowl to learn in when you are holding other people's energies, business goals, life, dreams, ambitions, challenges, fears, and all. That. Because yeah. it, you know, it's there's. You said earlier on, if if you can't do it, teach. Right? There, there's there's almost if you can't do it, coach. Because this industry is full of people that can't do it, but they'll bloody tell other people how to do it. And it's like, it's not about that. We, we are, I, I look at coaching, or I look at anything, when we're guiding people, it's very much like an orchestra. Right? You've got wind, you've got percussion, you've got brass and stuff like that. Now, individually, probably sounds pants. But without the conductor who can then just bring it together to create that symphony, right? that alchemy, that's the role that we play. But we're useless yeah. without all of that. Yeah. Just you know what I mean? And it's like that's yeah. it's not con it's not coaching, it's conducting in that way for me, and that yeah. creating that beautiful masterpiece. But they do the work, they play the instruments, they bring out the sound. We just conduct, we poke, we prod, we guide, we support, we challenge, as we said earlier. So and you I are think within the industry that I work in, and that sort of health, wellness, fitness industry, you know, there are a lot of people with very strong views. It's a quite an ego-driven industry. Yep. There's a lot of people that are proclaiming sort of messiah status, they're going to save you. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people that are proclaiming one size fits all, my plan will work for everybody. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of egos that won't refer on. You know, one of the things I'm very proud of within, within Tip the Balance is I know where the parameters of my expertise are. I may well be a PhD qualified scientist in infectious diseases. However, um, I am a nutrition practitioner. I am not a nutritionist and I'm not a dietitian. So I know when I'm working with a client, I know exactly when I need to refer them on to a nutritionist because they need something a little bit more in depth. Whether I need to refer them to a dietitian because they need something prescriptive, they need a prescriptive investigation, they need a prescriptive uh, plan, maybe. And we're not just talking, um, let, me, let me talk to you about macros. Uh, anyone can do that with my fitness pal in theory. Um, and I know when to refer on to a GP because they need some more investigations. Yeah. Um, and I pride myself on that. You know, I might have a lot of letters after my name. My ex-mother-in-law would tell you that didn't mean I've got any common sense. Um, but <laughs> I know where my boundaries are. I know where my parameters are. I'm, I am blessed, you know, for all I made a joke at the start about networking. In the four years that I had been networking, realizing the wealth of connections that you build up and the value in those connections in that you can then refer people on to them because you've built a relationship with that hypnotherapist you built a relationship with that reiki practitioner yeah. you built a relationship with that yoga instructor martial arts team you know whatever it is you know again that was a moment of, that was the point of that that every painful cup of coffee yeah. that was the point of that. you know because i met that person that day and we clicked we got on really well and i think you know yeah. being able to build that bank that referral network to be able to say to people you know what, I don't know that I'm the right person to help you, but I think I know someone who can. Yeah, I can't um, remember if it was Jim Rohn or Brian Tracy or one of the guys who said, your network is your net worth. Yes, I think Jim, I remember Jim Rohn saying it. I don't know if it was his originally, but I remember yeah. him saying it, yeah. Saying it. Yeah, he used to say it. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, a, it's understanding that to that level, in that not, just, yeah. not just saying it and going, oh yeah, yeah, as a, as a, to use your language, a wanky term. But it is that, 
you know, how when you have that confidence, it gives you that level of freedom that I don't believe most coaches ever get to because they restrict themselves because it is about them, right? So when you have that freedom to go, I know my limitations, let me, I'm not going to let you go. Let me introduce you to somebody. I've got you still, but let me bring in this person yeah. and let's yeah. work together. And then poof, and let's bring in this person. Out. And it's that, that's the approach where you are so focused on the individual and their outcomes and their results and them actually getting where they want to get to. That's what makes you the brilliant coach that you are. Thank One you. of many things, all right? So let's move on a second in terms of uh, it, your, your passion just screams out in terms of why you do it so uh, there's a question about understanding why people would need your services i'm going to come back to that a little bit later right? i want to go a bit further in, the, in in terms of you started to touch on some of the kind of horror stories myths negative stories about the industry that you're in mm -hmm. um, and i remember hearing one recently like a, a, a lady who had, had a gastric band fitted and she'd literally figured out that she could put milk in a jug and the Mars bars in a jug, heat it in the microwave, and then she could drink the Mars bars and therefore bypass the gastric band. And I'm yeah. like... The first thing in the morning, it does the same thing, opens up your brand. But it's like that, in, in terms of you touched on it earlier, they're not ready for it mentally. Surely shouldn't, somebody should be working here and here as well as the kind of here stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So what are some of the horror stories, myths about well-being... Uh, and the industry and nutrition and stuff that we can we can bust some of those myths right now. Oh God, this is so. Do you know what I think? In the last two years, probably, maybe it's been more. Maybe it's just my consciousness of it in the last couple of years. Now I'm much more heavily involved in the industry, but there's noise. There's no every single time you scroll through your news feed, every single time you are on YouTube and you know, you've watched whatever it was that you went onto YouTube for, but it's the next video that comes up that you get drawn into, or it's an advert that's popping up on something, you know, mm. there's just noise. You know, it used to be like Mr. Motivator on GMTV or whatever it was, or, you know, someone like that. They, they were the guru about fitness. Yeah. Now there's noise everywhere, all the time. Nutrition writing, diet plans, every celebrity that's, you know, breathed at all is then put straight onto some kind of program and then they're releasing some sort of, you know, book claiming to be an expert in something. And I think our biggest challenge in the industry at the moment is noise. Yeah. You know, I have clients that have been working with me that will sort of say to me, well, what do you think of so-and-so? And what do you think of it's no different to 10, 15, 20 years ago, people going, what do you think of Atkins? What do you think of the South Beach diet? What do you think of it? You know, and before that, our parents' generation, it was bloody cabbage soup shizzle or something like that, wasn't it? Whatever the chef they were doing then. You know, the industry, I believe, from being inside it, around it, outside it, a client of it, you know, all, all sorts of things. Unfortunately, it's an industry that's based on fear. You know, there's a bit of fear of missing out. There's a bit of fear of going backwards. There's a massive fear of failure. You start off feeling a failure. You do a bit of it, it's okay, but then you feel a failure again. And a huge part of the industry preys on oh, that yeah. sense of yeah. failure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my, my belief is that it's about habits and behaviors, and it's about finding your own personal, sustainable habits and behaviors that fit in with your lifestyle, fit in your family lifestyle as well. Mm. You know, because... To put yourself first and to change where you're at and what's happening for you, you have to put yourself first. And that's not easy unless you live by yourself. <laughs> you are a hermit. You know, so working with mums who are like, but I can't, I can't put myself first. I'm a mum or I'm a wife or I've got work. You know, it's kind of, yes, okay, there are excuses that are kind of, you know, we have to get through those barriers. This bloody hard for a lot of people to say, I am so unhappy with this. I... I need to make these changes and I've got to stop finding the reasons, you know, that affect everybody else. And I've got to start doing the right thing for me because it makes you feel selfish. Yeah. And I think you contrast that fear and that sense of I'm selfish if I do something to help myself and sod everybody else. Yeah. 
you contrast that with the money that's involved in the industry and the noise that's involved in the industry. So are we supposed to be eating tons of protein? Are we supposed to be eating no carbs at all? Are we supposed to be doing this? Are we supposed to? Should have, would have, could have, bollocks. You know, you have to find the thing. Your biochemistry is different to mine, partly because you're a bloke and I'm a woman, but partly because we are just different human beings. The human body is ace, as we keep saying. You have your own genetic footprint. You have your own biochemistry. Yeah. So what might work for you won't work for me. What works for me won't work for you. What might work for me might not work for my brother, even though in theory we have matching genetics, but our yeah. hormones are different. So it's about being open to individuality and finding the right thing for you. And I think noise, yeah. public noise, in your face noise, on your social media thread, noise is the, I think the, one of the biggest challenges of the industry at the moment. Yeah, I remember hearing, um having a conversation uh, with somebody years ago who's, who was a nutritionist. Um, and they, they actually were the nutritionist for Man United. You know, I'll pick that one up, right? Because it's not my football team, as you know. So, but it was that, we used to take, we used to take the mick out of it because we was like, oh, what'd you do? Cut, cut the oranges up at half time. Um, because <laughs> we all played local football teams and that's all we had. That was in nutrition. If you weren't smoking a fag or having a beer afterwards or before the game, you're having oranges at half time to balance it out, right? Um, Thankfully, football's moved on quite quite a long way. But the, the um, she had a challenge with sesame seeds. So a tiny little sesame seed would send her body into shock. Yeah. And then the organs and everything else wouldn't do its daily job. So she was gaining loads of weight and, and getting really unhealthy. And her organs were struggling because there's this tiny little alien thing of a sesame seed. Her body went into absolute combat survival mode to... to attack it get it out of her or break it down and it couldn't break it down and while it was trying to break it down the other things weren't doing their job right and i'm like that fascinated me like something that everyone's telling her that hummus is a brilliant thing to snack on <laughs> she's like so but hummus is a brilliant thing to snack on. everyone says it's the healthy thing to snack on hummus and vegetable sticks and she's like not for you not when tahini literally causes your body to go into meltdown yeah, <laughs> but that. yeah exactly <laughs> but that's that goes back to the fascination you said with biology earlier because i'm like this is how how could something so tiny have such an adverse effect in the human body right yeah. and it's like how can things lie stagnant for so long and then suddenly be something trigger them whether that be your kind of nervous system out of kilter your kind of even even your mental health yeah out of kilter and then you 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 kind of your, your what do you call it your immune system goes oh now's a good time to attack because you'll get through it's a clever kind of perverse system in ways isn't it yeah, absolutely. And, the, you know, this is one of the things I loved about studying the virulence of pathogens, understanding the slightest, tiniest changes in the host in us yeah. that makes them think, ha, that's it, I'm in, da, da, you're in life, Lynn. And, you know, you can, you can go and do whatever it is you need to do. And then equally, when we're not in that state, switching off because it's pointless. It's pointless for them to be like that. Yeah. You know, it's and understanding the balance of, you know, we have more microbial cells in our body than we have human cells. And understanding that the balance of those is absolutely critical to your body functioning properly. And, and, and nutrigenomics is a huge field of interest at the moment, actually working out, you know, what it is that's going in your body, sort of it's the environmental triggers, if you like, you know, what that means for your body's ability to resist disease or be susceptible to disease or develop disease. That's huge. Yeah. The, the whole kind of nutraceuticals, you know, what you're supporting your body with, how that affects your whole health of your system. That's a massive industry at the moment. And then obviously looking at your microbiome, you know, microbiome biology, the guts, the bacteria that are living in your guts, as well as, you know, all over your body, but particularly in your gut, the effect that they have on your mental well-being, on your, on your sort of neurological performance. You know, this is another huge psychobiotic thing that's known as. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's a massive field of interest at the moment. Um, and ultimately, the biggest effect on that isn't whether you have a yakko or other microbiological products are available, obviously. Um, but it's what, what you're putting in your body, what, you know, what food is going in there and the effect that that has on your microbial profile. It's fascinating. And how it's, it's we're talking about the kind of horror stories and the myths and stuff like that. So we surely we're much more accessible now to this stuff. We've got so much information available at our fingertips now. 
and I know we talk about Googling is a dangerous thing to do, right? But it, I, I don't know whether you even know, right? But how many people are going, living their lives in a sleepwalking pattern, are completely unaware of how much harm they're doing to themselves because they never stop and think, or they've never been checked, or they never knew they could be checked. You know, where do, where do we go to find out if nutrition is a, 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 an area to start with? I think for everybody it is. You wouldn't put shit fuel in a car and expect it to perform well, would you? But because it's such, for so many of us, eating is almost a mindless activity. It's okay. something that we just do. Yeah. I don't think most people realise the magnitude of the impact that it can have. Marry that with the busy lives that we lead and the fact that so many of us lead, lean on convenience food. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't just mean, you know, pre-packaged thing meals, but even, you know, how many of us have been ordering food boxes in, in lockdown because we don't even have to think about it then. We just, yeah. you know, we'll just whack that in. What's the recipe for today? You know, we, we've both done that because we're kind of trying to work and feed families and all sorts yeah. of things. So, you know, I, there's, there's all of that, you know, the busy lives that we're leading. There's the noise that I talked about and the confusion that people don't really necessarily know which way to turn. And then also one thing that makes me sad is that stress has just become a normal part of life. Mm. And it's almost like this, yeah, but everyone's stressed. No, no, they're not. I don't, you know, one of the questions I ask my client, when I work with corporate clients and I'm looking at work, workplace wellbeing in particular, one of the first questions I ask them when we start that workshop is, when did you first hear about stress? And some of them were like, oh, my parents always just say, I'm so stressed, or you cause me so much stress. But a lot of them say they, they don't remember the word stress being around when they grew up. Mm. You know, my, my dad fell ill when I was about 10. He has an autoimmune condition. And, and I remember being told it was a stress-related condition and thinking, well, my dad doesn't get stressed. He's like the most chilled out person I know, but dad's way of dealing with stuff was to internalize it all. My brother does the same. Mm. Um, swan. Um, but realizing that the absolute physical impact of stress is one of the most important things I think we can educate ourselves on. You know, the, mm. the effect that it has on our blood pressure, the effect that it has on our digestive enzymes, the effect it has on our sleep, the effect that that has on our metabolism, all sorts of things. Mm. It's such a massive topic to, to go into, but a stress response in your body is the same whether you are feeling a bit low, whether you're having an acute anxiety panic attack, Mm. or whether you are full-blown under stress all the time, relentless. You are having the same physiological response. The magnitude of it is different, but it is the same physical stress response in the body, and it is real. And I think this is what a lot of people don't, don't realise. And when they just live, everyone's stressed. Everyone gets stressed. Yeah, we do, but you don't have, it doesn't have to be just what happens in life. But it seems yeah. to be that that is the way. Now, I hope lockdown in some respects has helped people, you know, redress that, but then it's brought other stresses along with it too. Yeah. I, I remember seeing a program with Dr. David Hamilton in, uh, someone yeah, I, know yeah, yeah. About. I know, look at you, we're not going to be David. Oh, <laughs> but it is, what a surprise, I heart me right there. Um, I can't remember if it was David or um, somebody else on that documentary, but they said like years ago, this, our stresses were like a saber tooth tiger. You know, and that's when we went into the fight or flight mode because we'd have to fight off the saber to the tiger. We'd have to run away from it and stuff like that. So that was what stress was. But we don't have saber to the tigers now. The saber to the tigers of today are, you know, you're, you're going to get home late from work. So you're getting the earache from your partner. You've got uh, several emails to get done and stuff. Your phone's not stopping. You're constantly interact. You know, in lockdown, we've become so more connected using technology, but almost the amount of things I had to turn off before I got on this call with you to make sure that we aren't interrupted during this call. It's crazy. It's I think crazy. lockdown in particular, we, we are experiencing or have experienced four months of many of our proactive liberties being taken away. Yeah. So life has become reactive. Yeah. And so that's a forced stress upon us as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And a lot of people find that quite difficult. <laughs> oh my God, I don't want to rest. <laughs> we're doing something. Yeah, who are you talking about? But I think that, that whole um, reactive life that we've been living, yeah. 
you know, we, we tune in at five o'clock on a Thursday to be able to hear what we're allowed to do on a Monday or what we're not allowed to do from Friday. Or, and then we're like questioning, well, how come? What is it that's going to change at midnight tonight that means tomorrow we need to wear a mask? Yeah. You know, it, so we, we are in a reactive state at the moment. And I think, you know, it will be very interesting to see. Lots of people are worried about their COVID curves, obviously, because, you know, a lot of people have put on weight yeah. because they've been sitting at home. They've not been as active as they could have been. They're bored. They're worried, you know, all sorts of reasons that people are doing things differently. A lot of people are drinking more, partly again because they're bored, partly because they've got kids at home and they're homeschooling them. Well, you know, all sorts of, of reasons. Partly because we don't have to drive tomorrow. Oh, I'll have a couple of tickets. That's true, yeah. yeah. All sorts of reasons. So COVID curves are an absolutely definite thing. The pandemic corn, which is, is, you know, taking on an identity of its own. Oh, I love these names. Have we got any more? <laughs> COVID curves, pandemic corn. Something. Um, <laughs> No, I'll think of something. Lockdown me, liposuction. Is that a product to launch? Lockdown liposuction? No, probably not. Um. Lockdown love handles. Lockdown love <laughs> handles. There you go. There's another one. We can keep these coming for ages. But I think, I think people are acknowledging that it's not been an easy time and that that has taken a, a you know, that's had a physical effect on them as well. Hormonally, that will mean that your body is quite often sent into a fat storing state. But none of these things are permanent. You know, it's not too late to do something about it. Anything that you can do is enough. It is good. So, to how can we manage that stress better? How can we start to make changes? What can we do? It's difficult, isn't it? Because we are still in this reactive mm. state. There is, there are still not a million things that we can be proactive about. There are not, you know, we can't go and do some of the things that we want to do necessarily. But in terms of getting out and getting active, being outside, big sky, you know, I'm, I'm a massive believer in the therapy of big sky. Yeah. When Chris died, I took, about six months after Chris died, I took the boys up to the Lake District. I remember again, George, nothing, saying, are we actually going to be okay going on holiday without daddy? Bless him. And I remember thinking, apart from physically driving us somewhere, I'm not sure what exactly you think daddy could like put into the entire prep for holiday thing, you know. Um, but hey, I needed to go and sit up a mountain. I needed to go and look at the big wide world out there and think, what's happened to us is massive, but the world, the universe is bigger. Yeah. Big shit happens to everybody. Yeah. And you just, you deal with it in whatever way you need to deal with it. So I think one thing that lockdown has done has made the world feel like a very small place for a lot of us. Mm. And one of the beautiful things about being away last week was just being able to lift my chin, put my shoulders back and breathe and, and just experience being outside, water, sky, breeze, mm. you know, just being able to go places and, you know, yes, we had to wear masks and stuff, but look up. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the big things, like I say about lockdown is we've all become very, <laughs> so remember to look up. Brilliant. And there's a mantra that you, you use regularly. I see it in your hashtags. Oh my God, there's a lot of the cap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in terms of the message that you share and you, you did a brilliant live on this a little while back, which is change one thing. Yeah. You know, to start the process is, yeah. it's, it, it feels like it's an overhanging cliff, right? That where do we, oh, yeah, but I've got my weight and I've got work and I've got this and I've got kids and where do I, uh, and it's so easy to just get constantly caught up in that storm that, where do you go? So change, tell me about change one thing before we move on. I guess change one thing came, so part of it comes from the scientist in me. I'll come to that in a minute. But I think so many people, when they finally reach out for help, yeah. they are utterly overwhelmed and they don't know where to start. Yeah. So I believe the key to success is tiny, tiny steps, yeah. tiny steps. So I, when I started my journey in, in network marketing, loads of people used to say, oh, you've got to read the slight edge. Jeff Olson, you've got to read the slight edge, brilliant. And I tried, but it was all a bit twangy, twee, American, like, oh, all right. And someone said, try Darren Hardy. 
mm, compound effect. I remember, absolutely. I remember getting an audio version of the compound effect and it was like someone had literally picked up a baking tray and smashed me over the face with it. It was like, doing kind of, whoa, moment. Yeah. And that, I think, sort of clicked in with my scientific mind, that whole, you know, building momentum, I guess. You start small, you build on that, and the moment, you know, some, at some point you get what techni technically my chemistry teacher referred to as a woof moment, um, where it kind of starts, it starts, it starts, it builds, it builds, and then it goes woof as you get that ex exponential woof, basically. Yeah. It just yeah. kind of takes a long time and suddenly, you know, rockets. And I love that. So, you know, I've, I've read and I've listened to the compound effect a lot. Mm. And, you know, one of the great things that he talks about is, you know, if you've put on 20 pounds, you haven't done that because you want to eat a cheeseburger. You know, you've probably done that because the little choices you made day by day have not been the wisest of choices. Yeah. Now, those unwise choices have compounded and over time you've managed to woof in your own way and, you know, put on 20 pounds. So my understanding of that was the same has to be able to happen in reverse. You need the same opportunity in reverse, right? So yeah. you need to be able to change one thing to build on that. When you're confident with that one thing that you're doing differently, then you can, you know, you build in another new habit. And when you're confident with that, you build in another new habit. And those effects, the momentum will build, the compound effect will build, and you will get your woof moment. Your weight will start to come off or, your fitness will start to grow or, you know, it's the same thing if you start walk running and, you know, you're like, oh, this is shit because I can run like 30 seconds and then I have to walk for a minute. And it's like, yeah, but in two weeks time, you're going to be running for three minutes and you're going to be walking for 30 yeah. seconds. Yeah. You know, put in the graft, put in, put in the effort and build on it, but do it slowly and carefully. And, you know, that I said earlier, that links in with the scientist in me, you know, when you're doing any kind of experiment and you want to change something, you want to change the outcome, you can only change one of your variables. Otherwise, you're not going to know what's caused the, what's yeah. caused the effect. So, you know, that scientific approach to what we do, particularly if I'm working with someone who's got an intolerance or an allergy or something, maybe not an allergy, I'd probably refer them on. But if someone's got some kind of digestive intolerance or some digestive challenge, stripping things back and then changing one thing at a time you know yeah. if we chuck gluten and dairy and yeast all back in there at the same time and symptoms start again which one was it that was causing the problems yeah mm -hmm. it's exactly the same it, you know we talk about it in, in in marketing terms and in the business in terms of testing and measuring if you start to do something if you're doing loads of stuff well you don't if you change everything you won't know what works you've yeah. you've got to test and measure stuff for a period of time to see the outputs and then yeah. tweak and then tweak and then tweak and then tweak. So that brings us nicely back to then the business question. So moving away slightly from the, the detail of the nutrition and coming back to you starting the business and everything else. Um, what setbacks have you had so far in terms of running your own business back and how would you, how did you overcome them? So I guess that first transition from working a business that was someone else's model, if you like, and you know, don't get me wrong, I still believe in, in the network marketing model. I'm still very proud to work with Forever. Um, it, worked for, it worked for me. It was hard work, but it works for me. Yeah. Um, it's one of the massive challenges I think I had when I worked just with Forever was that I spent a lot of time feeling I needed to apologize for people that were doing it badly, that were building a business irresponsibly. Mm. Um, but that's even brave ad ad admitting that, right? Because there are some, there are some of them are, and I, this is why I've, I love more the, I've always loved the, like the direct selling association models the most, and I've worked with them internationally and stuff, right? The different models, and some of them have worked brilliantly in other countries and just flawed massively in the UK because they've tried a different approach that just has worked elsewhere, and, and we don't need to go through the names, but there's been investigations into some of them, and they've ended up paying massive million pound fines and stuff. Like that. Yeah. So, but there was always a reluctance from the owners of these models or the, if you like, the leaders within these models to even accept that it was being done badly. Yeah. And in, in fact, in some cases, they were using those examples of those individuals that had taken the model and accelerated it and had their woof moment, but not necessarily in a caring, abundant, sustainable way. Yeah. They've, they've kind of done it and they've been the next shiny object to yeah. almost prove their model works. And that's right. damage to the industry, isn't it? It has. And I think it's done damage to, you know, certain companies in particular. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, with the advent of social media, with the, ad you know, the 
the generation that came into the business with social media being absolutely the way that they've kind of grown up, come through their teen years and into their professional years, if you want to call them that, in their in their 20s or whatever, you know, they were having stratospheric growth and that's amazing and, you know, good on them. It worked for them. One of the things that I found difficult was the disregard for what had gone before or the that's not blanket, it's just some of them. Yeah. And as you say, you know, they they are they are put, at times put on a pedestal. They are, you know, they are, it is like a magpie moment, isn't it? This is the new shiny thing. Yeah. You know, we're lucky that some of the new shiny success did um, incorporate the values that forever have. You know, they, they were proud of our founder, Rex Moore, and they were, you know, you cut them in the middle and they were forever through and through. They, they understood the, mm. the power of the business model, but they also understood that people were at the heart of what we do. And, not everybody does that. And you, you know, you're going to get people that are tossers in every business, aren't you? Whether it's a conventional business or it's a network marketing business. But I think that advent of spamming people on social media and with forever in particular, you know, we had a really strong period in the weight management industry, but then it became, everything was about, you know, clean nine detox programs and all this kind of stuff. It was all over Amazon. It was all over social media. People were doing things in a way that was against our marketing plan. So if you knew your marketing plan, you knew what forever was about, you knew that they were doing this wrong, yet they seemed to be getting away with it. Yeah. So it was a tough time for forever in the UK, you know, a few years ago. And, and I'm really proud of the way that forever sort of hunkered down and our old guards, if you like, you know, the, the, the leadership team that we've had for a long time, um, they stood their ground too. And, you know, they're still very much part of the business, very actively involved in the way that, that Forever work. And as like, like I say, I'm still very proud to be associated with Forever. I've, I've run the opportunity meetings in, the, in Bristol and, and, and run trainings in the Southwest for a long time. And I'm proud to be someone that they trust to do that. And I'm proud of the relationships that I've built within the company to be interested to do that. Yeah. Um, but I'm... I knew that, that that I needed to take my business somewhere else. I knew that it had to, to be something different. Hmm. And that was interesting. So we'll, we'll, we'll come on to kind of how people can get in touch with you later in, in just before we finish, because I've got a couple of quick fire questions. Uh, but there's one more I want to ask you about the business, if I can. Uh, oh, and say hello, to, say hello to Bob next time you see him for me as well. Okay. Um, but yeah, so because you've got the, the nutrition piece, you've got the forever piece, and you're also a qualified Nordic walking instructor. You do well being walks as well, which is uh, the outdoor, like the big sky stuff you're talking about. So you've got the physical exercise and the experience of all ages and all kind of uh, abilities. Yeah, that was quite a selfish reason that I went into that initially, I guess. You know, I was always fascinated by, what are they doing? They're walking on with sticks. What's that about? And then I looked into these it a little Nordic bit. Poles, right? These are these yeah. Nordic yeah, yeah, these, these Nordic poles. So it looks like we've forgotten our skis. That's what it looks like. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I remember kind of digging, digging into it and thinking, oh, okay, so the theory is here that it's about it's something to do with the biomechanics. It's something to do with getting the four quarters of your body to work most efficiently. I was yeah. thinking, I love running, but I'm shit at it. Let's face it, let's not dress it up. I am a shit runner. Um, but I enjoyed being part of our, our local running club. And I was just thinking, if I could learn to move the four quarters of my body more efficiently, then would my running become more efficient and I would be you know, less of a, like a panty sex pest behind people than, you know, I actually feel like I was getting somewhere with, with my running. So it was a selfish reason initially that I went into Nordic walking. Yeah. But I absolutely loved it. And it was one of those moments of you, you learn a technique and then when you, you know, the well, first time we went, we might have been taking a piss a little bit. We won't take it particularly seriously. But we were learning how to do it and you build, when we teach, we build a technique up in sort of several layers. And I remember at one point sort of putting that final layer in and literally feeling this cross across my abdomen light up and thinking, jeepers, like my upper body is helping my lower body to move and I'm lighting up my core while I'm doing this. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, my shape started to change, I got fitter, I got stronger and I was thinking, shit, there's something in this. Okay. Well, that's not what I expected. And then my, my instructor invited me to to train as an instructor and I, you know, I love it. My Tuesday mornings are the most brilliant group of people um, to spend time with, but you know, they've all got their own stories as well. And some of them do it for fitness, some of them do it for friendship. Yeah, the all team. sorts of reasons, but you know, there's times when we'll turn up and you can tell someone's had a humdinger of a morning before they arrived. 
But an hour later, by the time we are sort of putting poles in the car and going and grabbing a coffee together, they're like a different person. Whatever it was, it's in the sky. They've yeah. talked out, they've walked it out. Yeah, well, you know, you know, that's my approach sometimes. It's like we're not having a coaching session around the table. Get, grab, grab a pack of sandwiches. We're going for a walk. Absolutely. And it, and it matters, you know, it's that adaptability and that, that ability to go, right, this feels different. We need to do different, be different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Talk, talking side by side is totally different to talking face to face. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's great. Exactly. So in terms of your company, possibly industry, but how do you see the future of your company? I would hope that it's a naturally evolving beast, if you like. So it, it feels like it's evolved a lot already in, in the last sort of two years. I didn't ever expect to be involved in corporate well-being. Mm. It, it, it was a chance conversation with someone. And I think, you know, that's one piece of advice I would give to anyone who is, who is in business. Don't automatically think of all the reasons why you shouldn't do something. That's my next question. Cool. Oh, okay. Seamless. Um, because I found myself saying yes to something because I couldn't really think of a good enough reason to say no. Yes. But it's become part of my part of my role that massively challenges me. Yeah. But part of my role that I absolutely love. And knowing that you're working with people to help them tackle stuff that's affecting their productivity, their focus. Yeah stuff inside work stuff outside work the growing realization i think in the workplace that stuff outside work has a massive impact on what goes on in your four walls like it or not yeah um and again current situation has accentuated that massively for, yeah, for a lot of you, know, you know they've had to change ways of working working from home yeah. you know flexible working policies all these things have been available for years but companies haven't really embraced based on trust leadership culture mm -hmm. And that's the space that you're getting into now that yeah. is, is game changing because that leadership and that cultural shift in role, that's, that's change management. Change management is exciting and terrifying all at the same time because change is one of the most scariest things for, for most people. Yeah. But it should never be as scary than staying the same or staying somewhere where you're not happy, right? Yeah, exactly. And you know, I think being invited, as, you know, being invited into a workplace is an enormous privilege. Understanding that you then need to build trusting relationships with the people that you're working with, but also positioning with the people that have brought you in that at some point you're gonna to need to give them some feedback. That's yeah. not gonna be easy to deliver and it's probably not gonna be very easy to hear either. Are you ready for that? Yeah. You know, and even when they say, well, yeah, you know, we know that we need that help, still knowing that that's gonna be a bit of a uncomfortable conversation. Yeah. But then equally, I, you know, my responsibility is to them as much as it is to the employees and the team members that I'm working with. And, you know, it's not good enough to go in and go, well, you know, they're saying this and they're saying that. And then, yeah. you know, being able to work with them and say, so what, you know, how can we do this differently? Tell me about the values. Tell me about the ethos of this company. Tell me about how you nurture your individuals. Tell me what it means. You know, you've got this strap line in your mission statement. What does that mean? You know. Mm -hmm. To me and your team, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? How do you deliver on that? Yeah. You know, and, and that takes me right back to that pillars exercise that we did when you wanted me to explore what my business was going to stand for. Mm -hmm. And being able to take that into a corporate environment and for them to go, oh, okay, we need to do a bit of work on that, don't we? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's a big anchoring moment, right? It's like when you look at, we, we, we used Man United as an example earlier. So Roy Keane was the anchor in that team for a number of years. And when Roy Keane didn't play, the team didn't really function so well and stuff. Frank Lampard for Chelsea, you know, Stephen Gerrard for Liverpool and stuff. That central role that can distribute, push back, push forward. And that's when you're an outside body coming in, you're not caught up in the emotions, the politics, the bullshit, mm. the history, you know. And so it's, it's a very challenging, personally challenging experience but one of the most rewarding you'll ever have yeah. when you see a company change direction and people fall back in love with their own business and then the team fall back in love with why they're working there and you've yeah. got people that had already emotionally started to put their cvs online to leave because they just weren't feeling that change or they weren't being heard they didn't have a voice and you know you get bought in because of nutrition and well-being and suddenly you're involved in this whole cultural shift that changes. Yeah. You're talking about leadership. You're talking about clarity. You're talking about expectations. You're talking about communication. You know, these are things that 
when I was working in the network marketing industry and I was going to Tom Barrett seminars to learn about leadership and learn, you know, he is, in my opinion, supremely knowledgeable about leadership, about communication, but my God, he's also the most incredible human being. And even being in a room with him, you cannot, you know, it rubs off on you. Yeah. He, you know, so it's, I, I did it several years of it back to back and I, you know, it was huge. And I go back to those notes now when I'm working with a leadership team and think, what, you know, how can I come at this differently? What can I share with them that, that will make that difference? And I think, you know, yeah, I might have gone in to talk to them about like, let's not eat crisps every lunchtime people. And the next thing I'm talking about, you know, standards and expectations that then fit into the um, whole, uh, the, the annual reviews, their performance related yeah, pay. It becomes, it becomes the ethos of the company. Yeah, and like, you know, they have those moments and you think, shit, how did I end up like here with them? And, you know, the leadership team, I'm standing with them as they're sharing with their team. These are our, you know, bronze, silver and gold standards moving forward so that you guys all understand what our yeah. expectations are. But this is done in a consultation process. And I'm saying to the team, like, what do you make this? Do you understand that? What does that mean? How will you show this? Yeah. Do you understand that when it comes to your accreditation, when it comes to your review, do you understand what evidence you need to have collected along the way so that you can, you know, put your case forward for that? pay yeah. rights because you want to pay rights fine let's work on how you're going to put in your bid for that yeah exactly love it so you know if the, if the business grows in that area that would be amazing and you know i'm i'm always intrigued when people sort of approach me and say you know would, would you would you come and meet the team would you come and see if if it feels right to, to work with us and yeah well that, you're that's certainly part of my power team to refer out in that space because i've seen the effects uh, that you've had so 100% back you in that space and I do believe it will be a big part of your business going forward so uh, okay a couple of quick fire questions then before we wrap things up uh, this should really be easy for you and I'm sure because I think we've already seen well, it I've lined it up to be a complete failure <laughs> <laughs> so what are you reading right now what are you listening to or reading right now okay so I um, I started uh, way oh. of digital warrior on holiday, so I'm about halfway through this book at the moment. Recommend one of those books. I don't know if, whether you have them, but there are certain things that come up loads of times. You know, like, oh, I must read that. Oh, I must read that. I must read that. And then literally, you know, this was on someone's bookshelf, and I went, "Can I borrow that?" Um, so yeah, I'm I'm loving that. I love a book that is almost written as a narrative. You yeah. know, I like I love a story. So I love someone telling me a story as they're kind of illustrating a point to me. Yeah. So I'm reading that in the moment, but I've also, I've always got Dan kind of... Dan Millman, Way of the Peaceful Warrior. That's right, Way of the Peaceful Warrior, Dan Millman. Um, and I, I've always got a few books on the go at a time. So this is probably the most story-ish book I've, yeah. I've read. But I've always kind of got textbooky kind of things that I, that I dip in and out of. So I'm also reading a book called Eastern Body, Western Mind by Anna Dia Judith. So I bought this for my sister-in-law a couple of years ago, and then we had a conversation about four or five months ago. And she went, you know the book, that book you bought me? Yeah. She went, get that, read that. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, that's, that's quite a meaty text. So that's a real sort of dip in and out book. And that's really about, a little bit like Louise Hay. Um, yeah, referencing. And, and it's, it's looking at what's going on in your body at the moment and what could be behind that. Mm. you know and that's a bit woo woo for some people especially when they come to you because they think you're a scientist um but you know I love that part of what I do I love embracing energy work and um you know the, the whole mind body that's where I love Dr David Hamilton that sort of mind and body connection yeah um, Louise Hay was uh, I can heal you or you can heal yourself I can heal myself how to heal your, how to heal your body a bit yeah Kind of thinking of the title. We'll put it up in the link. Lent it out. I was looking for it in the bookcase earlier, but I've lent it out to someone. Yeah, I did mine as well. <laughs> uh, okay, so who's who is your go-to book or go-to author for either business or self-development? Then I would say Darren Hardy, Compound Effect. Every just a really pivotal thing, but also Tom Barrett. Oh. And Tom Barrett. Tom Barrett has um, the Communication Guys podcasts. Yeah. Uh, with Tim Downs, I think his name is, um, and they they must have a bank of like 50, 60, 70 podcasts. Some of them are 10 minutes, some of them are 40 minutes. Yeah. 
and they just look at all different kind of aspects of leadership and and business and and communication obviously they're communication guy um and it could be anything from conversations you're having out and about that you know will maybe lead somewhere to yeah. conversations you might be having with team members or to conversations you might be having with clients and getting to know the human being behind that i think has, has given me a whole different connection with his stuff but he's got a book called real leadership in real time um how to lead with high skill at high speed and it's just lots of little snippets that are that are in that that i quite like so i dip in and out of that that quite cool. a lot but i would and say I, yeah, and I, saw, I saw david hamilton's book i thought that was the one you were going to pull out to yeah i heart me is, is a brilliant book um and he's also got how how the mind heals the body, I think. And that's also a speaking, uh, a speaking gig that he sort of uh, tours around. So if you ever get the chance to go see him, yeah, you know, not only because he's an enchanting Scotsman, a very charming scientist, um, he has the most magical way of uh, explaining the chemistry, the biochemistry, that you know, the, the way that our neurotransmitters, our, our brain chemistry works. Yeah. And the the that that it makes it simple, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, you know, he's, he's brilliant explanation. So I Heart Me is a really good book. He's, he's a massive advocate of kindness, self-care, yeah. you know, and the impact that that has not only on you, but on other people that radiates out as well. So, brilliant. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, and finally, we, um, we're going to share links to get in touch with you and contact information, like YouTube channels, Instagram, stuff like that. Um, but in terms of any, anyone listening or watching that either has a question or, uh, wants to set, tap into a little bit more about what you've already explained and what you've explored with us. What's the best way that people can get hold of you? How do you prefer that they get hold of you, Becca? In whatever way they feel comfortable to. So some people will feel very comfortable to pick up a telephone and have a telephone conversation with someone. And that's something I learned when I worked with Forever. Yeah. Encouraging people to communicate in, in their preferred way puts them at ease to start with. So I don't mind if someone emails me I don't mind if they phone me and all those details are on my website. I don't mind if they are, you know, connect through, through social and, you know, stalk me for a while. That's relatively normal too. You've got to suss out whether I really walk the talk and mean what I say or I'm secretly like, yeah, down, you know, yeah. six pack of Mars bars or whatever. And tip the balance of your handle, right? On pretty much all of the social platforms. Yeah. Tip the balance. Lovely. Tip the balance UK. Tip the balance UK. Okay, fab. Thank you. So as I said, we'll put the links up for everybody anyway. Um, but look, that's, that's great. They can get hold of you the way that you, they want to, and you're going to be accessible in that way. So, uh, yeah, th listen, thank you. And I'm going to, I'm going to give you your full title without all the letters because I don't know them, but thank you, Dr. Rebecca Lightfoot for the time that you spent with us. And you can, you can give me abuse afterwards for giving your full title, but thank you for being so honest, right? It's been fun. We've had a giggle, uh, and I hope it's been as painless for you as it has been for me. So Absolutely. conversation, the conversations flowed and my mission is to get a little bit under the skin and behind the scenes with these companies who are giving them their time and their knowledge and their experience as somebody, you know, you talk about Darren Hardy, success leads clues is uh, something that he talks about as a principle, which is what he did with the success magazine interviewing people for years. So uh, I just wanted to get under the skin with people like yourself and share a little bit about who you are, what you do, because for a lot of people, we can see that business owners or business people can be unreachable. And that's just, it couldn't be further from the truth in my experience. So I believe wholeheartedly that there are brilliant stories that lay within each of us. Uh, and we've got no idea just how they could impact. It goes back to the pebbles you were talking about earlier. When we tell our stories and when we share our experiences, just how much of a trigger and impact that can have. So I mean it from the bottom of my heart, Becca, thank you so much for investing time with us and sharing your experiences with myself and our listeners and our viewers. So really appreciate it. You're very welcome. And um, very cheekily, you may see Maverick Minds behind me. Um, I would love to invite you back at some point to a Maverick Minds kind of get together um, where it's a little bit different, whether it's not a one-on-one -on -one interview. What I'd almost like to do is get people with sometimes polarized viewpoints and let's get some debates going on some of these subjects where, you know, if we're going to make a difference in the, in the world, how do we do that? What, what impact can we have? And yeah. let's get some real debate going. Not so, hopefully we won't have people walking out, you know, but from a point of view of, we want some discussions to learn and grow and understand where people are coming from. Uh, so it is a bit broader in its spectrum. And I'd love to have you as a guest on there if you would be. So Thank happy. you. That would be an honor.
cool. All right, fab. So we're going to be sharing this in, in terms of the podcast and the, the video and stuff. We'll get that out and we'll get all the links out. We'll also put some links in for these books that you mentioned as well and the, the ref, referencing a few people that you've mentioned throughout your journey. Ah. Right. Fab. Thank you ever so much. It's been a pleasure. Catch you soon. Thanks.